Yeah, yeah. So uh, Navin's mentioning the fact that Forbes, uh, there's a Forbes article that that coined or 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 uh, anointed me as the best virtual speaker that they've ever seen. And you know, it's really nice. And uh, you know, whether it's true or not, uh, it, it showed up in Forbes, and I will take it. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited to announce the first official sponsor of the Find Your Breakthrough podcast. Huge shout out to Manscaped. They sent me a dope package last week. Let's check it out. You all know that I love to stay fresh no matter where I am in the world. The Lawnmower 3.0 from Manscaped allows me to do just that. I'm cleaning up my tattoos, lining up my beard underneath the neck, and so much more. Grab yours now at manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free shipping with the code NAV20. Well, I, listen, I think 99% of people won't know who I am. So yeah, my name is Sean Canungo. Uh, people call me innovation strategist, disruption strategist. You know, I, I spent my entire career helping organizations with disruption, innovation, um, leading executives around trends, you know, what's happening in the in, in, in the innovation side, technology side of things. Um, also having equity in small organizations and, and helping them grow. Um, I'm, I'm really passionate about this uh, idea of innovation. I love uh, doing the research, I love applying it to organizations and uh, basically taking, re copying and pasting things from other industries and applying it to yours. Uh, that's what I'm passionate about. And I'm also like just passionate in other things like the creator economy, the the MBA, uh, yeah. social commerce. I mean, we, we talked about a whole bunch of this stuff and that's I think why we vibe and that's why I'm really excited about being on this pod and also because I don't know what the thumbnail is going to be on the on the stop uh, on the Spotify but those things are hype so, and that's why I want to be on here <laughs> I appreciate it. big shout out to my editor designer Dylan um so let's go before we kind of get the show started what's you know what's your why you know what what, what are you doing everything to achieve to me um my why is really influence others to uh experiment, to try new ways of doing things. Um, to me, that's where I get the greatest value. So if I can uh, inspire others to do the same, uh, that's just it. I think, you know, life is short. So just trying new, sh new ways of doing things. Um, I think that's my internal why. And that's what I'm trying to preach to others as well. And, and anybody sort of listens to my keynotes, um, that's like the punchline at the end of it. It's, it's really how do we go off and experiment? I love it. So this is how this is, this is all going to go down. We got a cool little introduction. There's some context behind who Sean is. Now we're going to go start going through each topic. I got a timer on my side just to keep us in check if we need to. And we're just going to flow through. We're going to have a lot of fun. I mean, like you said, me and you've had many conversations about this before. We did a clubhouse. We're doing all kind of cool stuff. And I know these topics I'm going to bring up are fun for you. And I think we'll have a lot of good conversation. And also, obviously, provide value to the listeners who may not know about some of these things or may want to learn more about it. So without further ado, I'm starting the timer. Our first topic of the day is disruption. This is what you do. This is what you are, you know, you're, you, you classify yourself as kind of like a disruption speaker. A lot of people don't know what that means. Yeah. So can you give us some context into what disruption actually means? Yeah. Disruption is when somebody comes into your space and fundamentally changes the status quo. You know, when people talk about the idea of disruption, they bring up the Ubers or the Airbnbs of the world, but it's really about um, how can you go into a particular space and really uh, change the entire uh, game? You know, it, I know you got a big basketball con uh, uh, audience. So for me, disruption in basketball is really Steph Curry, right? Steph Curry is not the best person to touch a basketball. He is not the greatest player ever. He will not go down as the GOAT, but he changed the game of basketball, right? He disrupted how the game was played. Um, and now everyone is following their lead. And that's what really disruptors do is they, they change the game. So people start following their lead. Um, and 
you know, that becomes now the new status quo. I would say the same thing when it comes to, for example, what Shopify has done for uh, commerce, right? They've made it seamless and intuitive and easy. Uh, I would say the same thing for, um, you know, what uh, TikTok, for example, has done for video. They made it easy. They made it compelling and performative. Um, to me, it's it, that's what it's all about. You know, innovation, by the way, is creating value in new ways. Um, and innovation can be incremental, but it can also be disruptive. And so I think that's what people get wrong about um, all these terms. So uh, yeah, that, that, that's the punchline. You know, a lot of people say right now that, you know, they've been disrupted because of COVID. And so they're using that as a definition of COVID. You know, it's not the it's not the right definition of it, but to be honest with you, you can use the word how, how, however you want. Yeah, right. I think it's just about, about thinking about changing the game. And that's how I, refer, I frame it. I love it. Beautiful explanation, which leads perfectly to the next one. But you kind of just mentioned, uh, you know, TikTok, Shopify, some examples. What are some of the top companies that, you know, you're looking out for or you already, you know, have started to cause disruption? Let's say not now could be a few years from now, maybe some predictions from you. You know, it's funny because when people think about disruption, they often think about the technology disruptors. So the Googles or the Facebooks of the world, um, Amazons, Netflix. But I'm actually really uh, passionate and curious about what I call cultural disruptors. You know, back in the day, if you want to disrupt an industry, you needed to have technological prowess. Like you have a better machine, a machine learning algorithm, you have a better tech stack. But um, we're moving into this age where I think um, understanding community and attention and culture um, is, is, is gonna be a big disruptor. So I'm talking about the, uh, the barstool sports the fashion novas, the um, even Tesla to to agree, like they become a cultural icon, right? Um, the um, the uh, you know some of the Chinese companies like uh, Douyin, the TikTok version of Douyin or yep. Kuo Shu, where they've in, uh, elegantly integrated a media and commerce. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I love what complex is doing from a media side. I love what creators doing. Like, I love what Mr. B, I mean, I know we're going to dive into this topic, <laughs> but worry. I love what Mr. Beast is doing. I love what, um, uh, you know, I love what you're doing. I, I, I think what you're doing is creating like a, a creator led, um, that's creator led entrepreneurship. And I, I really believe that that's the future. So to me, it's about the cultural disruptors. You know, many people have, would call them you know, maybe two years, three, four, five years ago, uh, you know, DTC brands, Casper, Warby Parkers, the Dollar Shave Clubs. But I think we're seeing a new generation, um, the Lyrical Lemonades. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go on and on and on. So many, the, the, yeah. the companies that understand culture, I mean, they're going to be the new disruptors. I totally agree with you. I love, I, man, I love the way you, you speak about it because it's, it's, it's eloquently put. So I love it. Um, before we really get into like some of the fun topics, I got one more for you because we didn't, didn't really get a chance to talk about it when it was put on Twitter and when it was announced, but I just want to give the people some context so they can see who you are. So can we, and by the way, and, and by the way, like uh, you never, you never sent me these questions. So this is all oh, yeah. off the top of my head. So yes, that's, uh, that's the fun yeah. of the show. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just so everyone knows yeah, these are not, you know, sent to him beforehand, but the Forbes article. Oof. The Can Forbes just, article. Let's, let's just touch on that a little bit because that that's in my yeah, yeah. eyes that was huge. So you know, take it away. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Navin's mentioning the fact that Forbes. Uh, there's a Forbes article that that coined or 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 uh, anointed me as the best virtual speaker that they've ever seen. And you know, it's really nice. And uh, you know, whether it's true or not, uh, it, it showed up in Forbes, and I will take it. And to me. Um, I'll say a couple things about this. Number one is a shout out to the the people in the back of making that happen. So the Mo and Mazin and Bad Films, uh, you know, give them all the credit. Uh, number two, I think it's a recognition for, you know, all the work that we've been doing in the space, uh, fundamentally disrupting uh, how keynote speaking or public speaking is done. Uh, we've turned it into a late night show. Uh, we, we, we've turned it into an experience. Uh, and to me, the, the thing that I think I love the best is that, listen, I'm, I'm from Edmonton, right? And, you know, it, it, when I go to different cities, people have no idea, like, 
where the hell we are. Yeah. Throughout my career, I always had to, nobody, nobody would tap me on the shoulder and, and, and sort of hand me anything. I always had to build my own uh, brand. I always had to do things by myself because I knew no one was going to help me. Yep. And to me, when I like reposted the thing from Forbes, I, I, on every single platform, I said, you know, from Edmonton to around the world, because it's like, you can do anything from any city that you're in. And for me, you know, that meant a lot because, you know, I am just a guy in Edmonton in a place that nobody has heard about. And, you know, you can still do great things. And uh, to me, that's really important. And so, yeah, it's, it was a really great recognition and uh, yeah, we've just been riding it. It's been, it's been amazing. It's when I saw that, man, I was, I was so excited. So I want to ask you this other question that builds off that. Do you, do you now classify, like, are you a disruptor? Are you a disruptor when it comes <laughs> to this, the speaking space in that world? Oh yeah. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think we have disrupt. I, I want to be, I want to be modest and humble. I think, um, you know, I think we have changed the game, elevated the experience. I, I definitely believe that we have disrupted it. I think a lot of people are taking the lead and how do we um, enhance our offering? How do, it's, it's, it's actually not a speaking. It, it's not actually not an event anymore. It's, it's television, right? We're, we're producing like a, a television show yep. that you can actually engage with. So to me, that is how we've changed the game in that space. And yeah, so I, I would say that we definitely a disruptor and you know i i like to think of myself as also a disruptor you know helping organizations thinking about new ways of doing things to me disruption is also having a mindset right coming into something and really um trying to change the game and so i think definitely in the space i would say that we 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 it's just not me i think it's it's us that are disrupting it i love it so let's let's get into some some of the fun stuff now Let's First go. Topic again, timers, you know, always changing and stuff, but we're going to restart it back to three minutes here. And this is like PTI. This is like, yeah, we'll move on. Yep. Yeah. So let's just dive into the hottest thing, probably, I don't know, in the world right now. Let's talk about Clubhouse. Just yeah. Give, give me some hot takes on Clubhouse right now. You know, Clubhouse right now, if you don't know what Clubhouse is, it's an audio only app. Uh, it's kind of like jumping into different conference calls. Um, you know, to me, what's the most fascinating about it is that it has, it, it, it's one of those platforms that you keep on going back to and, and you don't know if you like it or not, and you don't know what's happening, but you always want to check it to see what's happening. Now, do I want to stay the entire time? Not necessarily. Um, I, I think what they have done is, what's interesting is they've created this FOMO effect, right? You, yes. you, They've, they've, they're bring you, there's this ability to bring together thought leaders and unbelievable people in one room. I mean, it, it's like this remix culture um, happening in these rooms. So you, you don't want to miss it. But at the same time, the quality of the discussions is sometimes lacking. Like I still would rather listen to a podcast than listen to a clubhouse room, not only because the audio is better, but because um, hearing from others. I, I, I love the idea of hearing from everyone, but at, at some point, you know, you just want to hear from those brilliant minds and, you know, there's other people sort of weighing in. I don't know. I, I have no idea how to, um, uh, you know, think about it. It, it, but it is intriguing to me. I don't know. What are your thoughts? I and by the way, am I asking you questions on this too, or you can do whatever you want. This is an open, this is an open forum show. Okay. What do uh, you think, man? What you, no, what's your thoughts no on it? I think Clubhouse is interesting. I think you hit it on the head with it's like jumping in, in and out of conference calls. And like a lot of the time for me personally, like for example, you know, Mr. Beast was in there the other day. I, uh, I was there. I was in. Yeah. So I was there for like maybe 10, 50 minutes and you know, they, he didn't speak until I think the end of the show. So I didn't have the time to sit and listen to everyone else speak about that stuff. So just like you said, it's like, it's almost, it would have been better if it was just a podcast or it was a YouTube show. So I could just go, you know, see what Mr. Beast had to say but I know he's crashing servers and all that kind of stuff, but I jump into rooms every other day. But when I jump in, just like you said, it's like, and it's not me being rude or, you know, it is what it is. Like, I just don't want to hear everyone speak about the thing. I want, like you said, I want to hear like the top of the top, you know, speak about the topic and kind of flutter out, you know, the noise in between. 
So that's what that's what's tough about about uh, Clubhouse. But building on that, what do you think the potential of Clubhouse is? Yeah, I know. I I think um, Clubhouse is not a disruptor. Like I don't think it's disrupting anything. I don't think it's disrupting podcasts. I think what it's doing, it's actually creating a new market, and that's like you know, it, it, it's different from disruption where you take away, you change the game, you take away market share. There's another sort of area where you can create a new market. And I think that's what Clubhouse is doing. It's creating a new market for what um, audio consumption looks like. And and to me, um, in its current format, I, I think it's really interesting. It's ca- it's caught the attention, uh, you know, for a, from a, maybe, maybe a very small minority of people um, and I would say Twitter is probably a very small minority of people. It's caught that attention. And I think we're just in the first innings of what yes. um, audio participatory audio looks like. Uh, to me, I love the idea of conversations. It's not just content. You know, we look on Instagram and, you know, all these Twitter, you know, you know, uh, TikTok, and it's really about the content. Wow. This is really about the conversations. And I think it's like the first innings of what a more of like, conversation driven uh, uh, platform really looks like. And I'm just fascinated to see it evolve. I, I think it's going to be, it's going to create its entirely new ecosystem of businesses on top of it, of creators on top of it. I mean, it's really exciting to see. Yeah. And I think what's cool is like you just mentioned, I think we're starting to see the evolution, obviously like, you know, Twitter spaces is, is starting to come in beta and obviously I'm yep. sure Facebook, and Instagram will do something so what do you think will happen? This is the next question anyways, just kind of talking about Twitter spaces and the evolution of Clubhouse. Do you think, let's say Twitter hops on, then maybe Instagram has their competitor. Does that, to you, is that a better option to continue growing this conversational piece as opposed to using Clubhouse? Well, I mean, I think it's the age old question um, in terms of, you know, if you build it, will they come? You know, Facebook, whether it's through um, their experimentation process where they've, they've tried, they've tried to copy everything, right? They tried to copy Instagram. They tried to copy All Snapchat. They, they, they tried to copy everything. And for some reason, sometimes it just doesn't work. Now, Instagram uh, was able to copy Snapchat and it was uh, successful. And obviously it's trying to copy TikTok with Reels. I mean, I, I'm not sure if that's been a, a boom for them. Um, it was trying, you know, with IGTV, they took a play out of, you know, YouTube's book a little bit. So everybody's trying to copy each other. Um, I think at the end of the day, it has to come back to the culture that you created within the app. I think um, it's going to be difficult for another uh, company that already has established sort of culture and how people use it to use the way to to, see what Clubhouse has done. I think they've done a a really brilliant job at, uh, slow dripping the invites and cultivating a certain culture on Clubhouse that it's difficult to reset um, on a completely new platform. I'm not saying that's not possible, but it's just that cultural piece is so important. Like you could create the greatest app, a similar app in the world, but if you don't have that culture um, of how people use it, then uh, you're not gonna be able to replicate that success. I think you have seen it with you. It's just like, you can't just copy an innovation and just make it your own. No, I totally like, look at, look at like LinkedIn took snaps stories, right? Like Twitter took snap snap stories. Like, it, you know, it, it just doesn't pop. It's just not the platform for it's it. Not the, it's not the same. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that. Um, okay. Moving on. Cause we passed the timer. So oh, we I want to okay. ask, ask you this question and the question is, you know, what do you, for you, what do you think was the biggest fail of 2020 when it comes to a company or a brand or a product or anything? Yeah, I think the biggest fail definitely, I mean, it's, it's, it's an easy one, which was Quibi because Quibi uh, launched in April, 2020 <laughs> and it failed, I think in like six months later. And the reason why it failed, I think, is that it didn't understand the cultural piece, right? Going back to this conversation about you can get product. Actually, I, I, I was like one of the few people that got quit a Quibi. Like I was on really? it. Like I, I had it. I subscribed to it. And the product was nice. It was nice. You know, you could flip it. It was nice. Um, the content, okay, the content wasn't great. 
Um, but I think what they didn't get is that the culture right now, we're living in a world where people want to share everything lives in your, in your, your iMessage and your WhatsApp and your messenger and your TikTok DMs. It's shareable bite-sized content. And that's what they want it to be. That's why they're called quick bites. But the idea of sharing that, um, those pieces, um, they just weren't able to do it. They weren't able to leverage creators. I mean, they got all these of uh, Hollywood stars, but it's like, you know, people don't have a true affinity for those people. So I think they just got it wrong from a cultural standpoint. Um, and that just goes back to what I fundamentally believe in is that the next wave of innovation is not technological, but it is in fact cultural. Mm -hmm. And the organizations, brands that get this um, will win in the future. Yeah, I, I, couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more with what you just said. And I had Quibi written down because I was hoping you were going to say that. And yeah, what, 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 what is, yeah, what is your thoughts on that? That's this? what I had, you know, Quibi. And it's okay, cool. Same kind of reasons with you. I've watched all kind of YouTube videos about it and stuff. But for me, it's just like, you know, they bet on celebrities and these figures as opposed to betting on the future, which are the creators. Yeah. They could have done a David Dobrik show, Mr. Beast show, and all these other creators, thrown them you know, probably half the money to throw these other people, you know, and probably would have had a pretty established product. But I, I, I think, I think they, I think, they tr like read uh, who's um, yep. Mr. Beast's manager. I think they did pitch Quibi for a show and they, they balked. So it's like, it just, it just boggles your mind, right? Well, I mean, that goes to show you the management uh, behind the brand. But anyways, that, that's actually really interesting. So to continue with the moving, let's talk about, and you actually just did a video on this. I watched it actually last night on, on the YouTube, but let's talk about GameStop. A lot of, a lot of crazy stuff happened with GameStop. So, yeah. What are your thoughts on everything? Yeah, I mean, I think the GameStop situation is a a microcosm of the world that we're moving towards, where you know you're seeing the power shift to individuals and communities. Um, I think it's a microcosm of what you're seeing around meme culture or remix culture, and you know it, the reality is it is a meme, and um, it, it it actually started out with. I, you know, I, I, I've been sort of deep diving in this because I was just fascinated. It actually started out with good fundamentals. You know, um, you know, the, originally they, they were within Wall Street bets. They were promoting it because they actually believed GameStop was a good buy. Um, and, um, you know, so, so which was against what most Wall Street guys thought. So, yeah. it, you know, to me, it was just fascinating to see it turn and really to see it turn into a meme. Um, and I think that is the story, is that we are moving into this like meme culture. Um, and we are moving into this world where the narrative is becoming so much more important than actual fundamentals. Um, and it, it's dangerous. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a good thing. Um, I think the stock market, it, it also sort of shows that the stock market is was never really, it, maybe once it was based on fundamentals, but now it has really become about narrative uh, more than anything else. And I think that we need to figure out how to regulate this thing in, in the best way. And, and, you know, many people on the other side would say on the smaller side, like, well, now you want regulation because the GameStop, well, it's, um, you, you don't want people, you don't want, it is a casino, like the stock market's a casino. You don't want people sort of losing their lives. And, you know, there have been situations on Robin Hood where people have taken their lives. And, and that's where I think you might have to step in to be like, okay, is, are we doing right for society and these businesses? Like, are we, is, is this good for GameStop? Like, I don't even know if it's good for GameStop. So I, it does raise some questions. It's interesting. I, I mean, I loved it, man. I, I loved it. I love seeing it. Yeah, I, was, it was, I was consumed. It was fun to watch, to follow the story. And just everything behind it and how it all got started on obviously you know reddit which is i haven't actually had time to dive into reddit but i've i'm seeing more and more stories come that have all stemmed from this crazy community that's on reddit yeah. which is quite interesting um but kind of just building off what you said something that's something that's been interesting too is like you now you go on tiktok and you see all these different stock accounts and all these different people you know calling themselves you know the investors of the future and I think it's like a, it's, that's why I think you, like you said, regulation is going to be needed soon because I think people are just pumping, you know, stocks are just being pumped from all types of ways to kind of, you know, make a quick dollar and kind of get out. So it's, it's, it's interesting to see how social media has played into that, but timer's up. So 
I'm trying to I try to be strict on this as as I, as I can because I know people this watch is awesome, it. So man. Like, hey, I now, know this takes a lot of prep to do come up with these subjects too. So I appreciate it. No, no worries. So this is something now I'm gonna be completely honest with you. This next topic, okay. Obviously, I, can, I consume your content all the time, but I, I rent we rent through it. And I, man, there's this word you start, started saying. I've never I've never heard this word before. I'm like, what the hell is this guy talking about? So I watched the video. I'm like, okay, this makes sense. Watch some other YouTube videos. And the word is moat, M-O-A-T. And the, you know, honestly, like I never, I just never heard anyone speak about it. So you heard you talk about that and Google it. Obviously it's a big thing. So can you give some context into a, po- a moat, a personal moat, however you want to describe it? Cause I think it's something interesting that people need to be aware of. Yeah. Um, you know, this idea of a moat is, you know, people mo- from a business perspective, they, they talk about it uh, when they talk about an organization having um, complete monopoly, right? You own the space. You are the front writer. You are the top dog. You have created something so indefensible that um, it just it's, it's difficult for other people to compete. So if you look at what, for example, Amazon has done in terms of their supply chain and their distribution and logistics, like they have a moat, like they, 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 they run the table on that. Um, to me, the idea of having a personal moat is figuring out what are you the best in the world at, right? What, what are you unstoppable at? What is something that is so a uh, you that, you know, no one else can come in and, 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 and really compete. And I think everyone has that every single individual has the ability to create their own moat uh, to figure out what their competitive advantage is uh, compared to everybody else. And if you double, if you identify what that moat is and you double down on it, then, um, you know, you, you, you're going to be able to, um, you know, just be unstoppable. And I think it's this idea. I, 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 I thought about this for a long time that I believe that everyone should be their own goat, right? We talk about goat, we throw it around like, you know, MJ's the goat of basketball. Like, why can't you be the goat of like, y- you know, uh, you know, pie making? Why can't you be the goat of, of, you know, virtual speaking? Why can't you be the goat of whatever it is, podcasting? So I, I think we've, by fragmenting all these different spaces, I think everyone is the goat of something. And, and um, that is your personal moat is is um is your unfair advantage in the world and uh, the sooner that you find it the sooner that you'll be unstoppable i love it we, ha- we have about 30 seconds left so why don't you tell everyone what your moat is yeah i i think my moat is the ability to uh bring disparate ideas together that have previously been unconnected and be able to articulate that in a way that is compelling to an audience. So that's why I can bring in things like, you know, talk about Mr. Beast to, you know, uh, Amazon to uh, Tom Brady and like sort of tie these things together. Um, I think that's to me and, 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 and articulate in a way that makes sense to people. I think that's my moat. I love it. Uh, so the next, the next three things, I'll give you one hint. The next three topics we're going to go over they kind of, and by the way, my camera, my, my camera here stops. So I have to go back to this. I don't know what happened. It's okay. Don't worry. Should I, should I get yeah, a new, we got it I, all. We got it all handled. Should I get a new, uh, anyway, okay. <laughs> don't, don't worry. Uh, so the next three all intertwined together. So we're going to start it off and you know, these again, all, all things you talk about all the time, the gig economy. Yeah. What, what can you speak on? First of all, can you just explain the gig economy? Maybe give some examples. Yeah. The gig, kind of yeah, the gig, yeah. To me, the gig economy is, um, where you are uh, beholden to an algorithm or a platform uh, telling you where to go and what to do. Um, The gig economy is mostly described as the door dashes, the Ubers, the task rabbits of the world where you are beholden to the platform. Um, And uh, I don't think you control your own time. Uh, You do control you. I mean, you have your flexibility, but you don't necessarily control the work. Um, if the, if a customer wants to go somewhere, you go where the customer wants to go. So that, that, that is really the, the idea of a gig economy. It's, it's a solo preneur, preneur facilitated by these digital platforms. So let's build that into the passion economy. So yeah. Now, what's your thoughts on the passion economy? 
Yeah, I think the, the difference between the gig economy and the passion economy, or as some people refer to as the creator economy, is um, the, 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 the fundamental difference is that you are monetizing your own unique craft, your own creativity um, at the end of the day. And um, I think it's very different than the gig economy because it is, it's doing something that probably you love. Now, in, in some parts of the passion comedy economy, people are doing it because they, they have to, they have to pay the bills. But for the most part, it, it is people that love what they do and are able to monetize. And it's not necessarily like influencers, right? I think it's, it's saying, how can I have a Patreon with 10 to 20 people and being able to live off that or a hundred people. So to me, it's being able to uh, have solopreneurs really monetize their craft. And I think this is going to be the largest uh, market for small businesses. And it's going to be um, there. And some of these companies, some of these creators in the gig economy are going to be billionaires. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. So we got, Gig economy, passion economy, you kind of mentioned it, creator economy. So now let me ask you this, are passion, in your opinion, passion economy and the creator economy, the exact same thing, or are they classified as two different things? So I think, um, I, you know, I, I will, I'll give, um, I, I'll probably pass on the definitions to uh, the person who created sort of the passion economy. You can talk, it's either Amy, Adam Davidson or, or Lee Jin who, uh, sort of coined the term passion economy. I I kind of think of them as the same thing. I think we're sort of in the same uh, ballpark of what they are. I, I'm going to treat them as the same thing. You know, I, I, I've been talking about this forever and I didn't call it the passion economy or the creator economy. I just said that this is the, the era of the individual. Um, that's how I coined it over the years that, that we are moving into the era of the individual. And so, you know, you call it for what do you, I think people are just using the creator economy uh, more commonly now. Uh, so uh, we can call it the creator economy. So <laughs> fair enough. So let's, let's take the creator economy and go one step further and talk about someone who's at the forefront of it all, which is going to be exciting conversations, Mr. Beast. Yeah. Right. So a couple of things I want to ask you, but first, I'm just going to let you give your thoughts on Mr. Beast and how he's potentially changing the game and why you like him so much. Cause I think he's a disruptor. I think he's yeah. going to be changing in so many industries. So, you know, what do you think? Yeah. I think uh, for those of you who don't know, Mr. Beast is Mr. Beast is a 23 year old YouTuber who creates really interesting content, right? He creates things like I got a million dollars, but I, but you only have a minute to spend it. Uh, yeah. Or I ate a hundred thousand dollar golden ice cream, like just really interesting videos, compelling videos. Um, primarily to do with money, not necessarily has to do with money, just outrageous sort of stunts. Um, you know, and, and most people think this is fun and, and it's great. I, I think the difference is, is that, and, and I think he really flexed this right before Christmas is when he uh, launched 300 virtual restaurants across the United States um, and actually put a dent in the food industry. You know, he, his app became the number one app uh, on the app store, usurping the Googles and the Facebooks for that a period of time and, and actually giving real money back to uh, restaurants. And I think uh, with his burger, the Mr. Beast burger, and I think what the most interesting part of this is that it shows you what the, the starting, the, literally the first innings again of what the creator economy might look like, the power of a creator, that they can actually put a dent into a vertical that they have never played in before. And I think this is what, we're seeing is that once you have the community, you can basically do anything. Totally agree. You know, I follow uh, his manager, Reed, you know, religiously, I'm sure you do as well. Yeah. And gosh, yeah. on a recent podcast, you know, you're saying like, you know, this is like, just like you said, this is just the beginning. They're already planning for bigger, better things, other industries. And I'm excited to see what else these guys can disrupt. Cause when they launched it, man, it was like blown away that the app was crashing and they had to, you know, cut off orders and all these kind of things. And now, I just saw something uh, yesterday, the day before that, you know, he's planning to also, you know, remove Shopify as a middleman for some future releases and with his app, you know, deliver merchandise with the food, which is another interesting, you know, play for me where he's literally just owning all his platforms. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I, I didn't hear that piece before, but um, to me, it's, uh, it's brilliant because 
you 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 want to be at a spot where you don't you're not dependent on anybody right you're not dependent on any sort of large platform whether it be um uh you know the facebook or the youtubes of the world or shopify's of the world and i think that's the true um that's where you have true community where you can sort of you know the test will be if if mr beast can go off youtube right and 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 not be beholden to youtube um, so I, yeah, I think it's really fascinating. And that's why I say I, you know, the, the next disruptors are cultural because they have that community and, and the creators have the community. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a fascinating space, man. The last, last thing I'll ask you about him is this is a video and thumbnails and all kind of stuff all over YouTube. Do you think he actually has potential to be YouTube's first billionaire? Is that a real thing? That I mean, achieve? oh yeah, definitely. I think he, I think he is going to be the first billionaire on YouTube, unless you put like, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you know, I, that or, or maybe Joe Rogan. I, I absolutely believe it. Um, it. It is kind of like a weird term to say first billionaire. There are billionaires on YouTube. I mean, um, but uh, are they purebred YouTubers? Yes. Yeah. I think what Mr. Beast is uh, comparatively to a Joe Rogan or a Kylie Jenner or, yep. you know, th- or, or whoever else is that literally they grew up on YouTube, right? They started from nothing and grew up on YouTube. So I, I think he has the biggest shot because he has already expanded his empire and yeah, he's got a rabid fan base. It's nuts. It's crazy. So who else are you excited about? Um, in terms of creators, so you know, you got Mr. Beast, right? Who so else many, do you man. like really enjoy? You know, I am fascinated with um, not necessarily YouTubers, where, um, but uh, by the way, the, the YouTubers that I love is Colin Samir. They're they're great YouTubers. They're, awesome. they're, they're yeah. talking about the creator economy. Um, I I think podcasts that you know what you're doing right now is the best way of creating because I think. The, the when you're in somebody's ear, it's a gateway to their brain. And um, I don't know if you would call like, um, you know, Bill Simmons a creator or Joe Rogan a creator because of creating a podcast. Uh, but to me, it's those people that are creating podcasts, the guys like James Altucher, um, guys like, um, oh man, I, I just listened to so many. Uh, it's unbelievable. Like, um, yeah, I just think that the people that are making really compelling podcasts, that's a gateway to your brain. And, um, you know, I, I, yeah, so, you know, I think what some smart companies have done, like The Ringer, like Barstool Sports, what they are doing is they have honed in on creators, like they have, their employees are creators, right? Their talent are creators, yep. and they're turning um, into their own sort of juggernauts themselves. And um, I think that's the most interesting piece. Um, I, 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 I'm fascinated with guys like, you know, Pomp, like Anthony Pomp- Pomp- Pompiano. He's awesome. Uh, as, a, as a creator, um, I think, um, who else, man? Like, yeah, I don't know. There's, I, I think there's just so many people. I just so many people like that I listen to. Uh, these guys like uh, Sean Puri. Um, uh, yeah, man. It, I, to me, that th- those are the people that I love. I'm on YouTube. I, I'm not a big like. I don't watch vlogs and stuff on YouTube. But um, you know, I, I respect people's hustle on YouTube. Guys like Eric in terms of his editing. I think yeah, what unreal. the guy named Gary Tan is doing around his content, uh, which is really uh, interesting. Uh, I think Jason Calacanis um, is a you know he's been putting out content around startups and business and he's a big investor like i i, I would c- term he's a creator so there are got a lot of guys that i love that are that are creating content and uh you know monetizing off that content it's it's pretty remarkable yeah so we talk about guys making you know money in outside of youtube and the pompliano brothers are perfect examples because joe i think oh i i forgot to mention by the way um andrew schultz uh, I think Andrew Schultz is probably one of my favorite creators. Uh, he's a comedian. And I think what he has done, uh, he's disrupted comedy. And he is, I think he's like the number one Patreon comedy podcast uh, wow. or comedy Patreon. And I think, you know, he's got, he did, he had a Netflix show right before Christmas. Like this guy is, he's, he's going to be like on the Mount, Mount Rushmore comedy pretty soon. And, and he's a creator. That's huge. That's actually, I'll actually have to check him out because I actually don't know who that is. So that's really interesting that he's that big. So I'll check him out. Um, but going back to the Pompliano brothers, 
you know, they, one of them has like an amazing, I think his name is Joe. The one that has a, the sports newsletter. Yeah, sports. Yeah. Joe. Um, yeah. He, the, he basically started like, like yeah. l- early last year. Like yeah. that's it. So this is on Twitter. I, I think the rise of the sub stack, you know, this year, I, I've never heard of sub stack before. I okay. got one. Everyone got one. So what's your thoughts on sub stack? I mean, I, I'm not as, okay. I, I, I think like anybody, um, you have certain mediums that you love. Like I love, I love listening. Like I love audio, right? So that's why I love, po- that's why I subscribe to the 500 podcasts. Um, I, I think that's probably my, my only love. Like I, I don't necessarily, wi- I, I don't necessarily um, read newsletters. In fact, my, my email box inbox is like a graveyard of a probably beautifully written content that I will never open up. So I think there is a, uh, like anything else, I think there's a minority of people that love emails. There's a minority of people that love video. Uh, yeah, but you, you seem bullish on it. I don't know. Yeah, I know. It's, it's just interesting to me. I, I, anytime something new comes out, I want to test it out. I want to be on there and learn it. That's the only way to do it. So I, I did it. I'm testing it out. Got subscribers, you know, put on newsletters here and there. It's just interesting to see like that that is another way to monetize heavily. I know, I think the top creator on that platform makes 500K a year. I think that's what I saw. It's just interesting. Like, you know, you're writing newsletters. Absolutely, it's interesting. <laughs> I, absolutely. Um, and I think it's a great medium. If you're a great writer, yes. Um, then I, I, I think what a lot of people are doing with their sub stacks, number one, they're writing up the same subject or they're just like pulling news from like other places. Where, where I think not only in uh, not only in newsletters, but just in audio, like people are interested in your take, right? What is your yes. take? What is your unique insight that you are pulling together um, that's interesting? And I, I don't think enough people have enough takes. They're just curating content. Like to me, like when I do a keynote, for example, like I like giving a take. Like I think people are there for the take. They're not there for me to replay information to them. They're there for the interesting take where I'm trying to pull together other things from other industries. And that's what I'm trying to do. So not enough people are taking. They're just, they're just curating content. Totally agree. I want, I want to throw one more creator at you that came to my mind while we were talking. I don't know if you know anything about him, but Ryan, uh, I think his name is Kaji, but Ryan's world. Are you familiar at all with Ryan's world? And- well, Ryan, Ryan is the, maybe Ryan is a YouTube goat because he makes yeah. $29 million, uh, uh you know, with, with the toys. Uh, no, I think it's, I think it's interesting. Um, you know, I have kids, I got two kids. I got a four year old and a one year old. Mm. I don't know if I would, um, get them to, um, leverage the YouTube, leverage YouTube the way that they did with him. I, I'm not sure if it's healthy and yeah, that's, I don't know. I think, I, I don't know what their parenting, you know, I, that, that, you know, I can sit on my, uh, on my soapbox and talk about parenting, but I don't know, maybe they figured out a way to, to mitigate, you know, any mental, it, it's just, you know, having that much success yeah. that early on a platform that's kind of toxic is it's, it can be tough. It'll definitely be interesting over the next few years to see how they diversify or how he grows. But I just think that it was amazing that, you know, there's a few kids channels, you know, that do similar to him, but the fact that he could do that and then, you know, get into a new vertical of making and selling his own toys and different things was awesome. So let's keep moving. We've got a few, a few last minute ones here before we kind of. No, this is up, fun, man. I'm loving up. it. I, I knew you would like this, this format. So I'm, I'm excited that it, this one's going well. So this is a, a little bit curveball, maybe. I just want you to give me what you think are some of the top traits for highly successful people. And what are, what are those people possess in them? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it is, you know, in my experience, uh, dealing with or experience with highly successful people, I think number one is, is actually having a positive mindset, optimistic mindset, you know, thinking that everything will sort of go okay or, or go well. I think you almost have to have that. I think a number two is this idea of unlearning. Like it's not necessarily just um, learning things, but it's the ability to unlearn, to reset, to reimagine, to take your failures or your winnings and being able to learn again. Um, you know, maybe that's a deep curiosity. And um I, I think the third is just really just obsessing with what you do, right? Like thinking about it um, constantly. Um, you know, to me, it's like 
this unhealthy obsession with the the thing that you love. And I think the most successful people, they just, they, they just go into something because they love it and they're, 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 they can work, you know, endless hours on it because they love it. So I think those are probably the three things. I love that, man. What about you? For me, my, my biggest thing is just having growth, having the growth mindset. I just think that's, it's just, it's just so important. I think a lot of people lack it from, you know, things I've seen and what I've heard, but it's for me, it's just having that growth mindset and just being able to, you know, have from, from the growth mindset, building into like the mentality and the work ethic, like every day, you know, being open to the challenge, you know, being open to that, like, you don't know what's going to happen and just understanding that, you know, there's going to be multiple challenges, all part of the process and you're going to get through it, you know, along the entrepreneurial journey. For me, it's just, that's yeah, just all it is. It. Like, I just think people don't, it's just, it's tough, easy for me to say it. I think over the years I've developed that and I understand like the process is so much fun and I just love losing money here and then making it back tomorrow. And then you're just figuring out how to build the next Nike. Like it's, it's fun, you know, but not everyone I think sees that. So growth mindset is the simplest way to put it. Love that. Um, okay. Last couple of ones. Uh, I think you'll enjoy these ones. Hopefully uh, blockchain. Yeah. I mean, uh, give me your thoughts, man. Just, just go ahead. Well, give me your thoughts on blockchain. <laughs> just give me, um, some, give me some thoughts on yeah, blockchain and more importantly, like, you know, what I'm excited. Like yeah. Just, just to, um, you know, I don't want to go complicate blockchain and, and the whole process for it. You know, the, the, the simplest way that I would describe blockchain is that if you gave somebody an Excel document and you, um, you know, you could enter all your information on there, but then everyone else could see it at the same time. And everyone has access to it and everybody can sort of add or delete things. Um, and everybody would see it. It would be fully tracked. So it's like everyone has access to this like special magical Excel document. Um, I think the promise of blockchain is unbelievable. The idea that we can uh, uh, re remove redundancies, that we can eliminate manual processes, uh, that it's, it's fully transparent. Um, and if you think across different industries, whether it's financial services or land titles or voting, like, I mean, it's going to solve a lot of problems. Um, I, I believe that um, we are still like five years away from really sort of truly starting to figure out what um, the future of blockchain is going to look like, even though you see Bitcoin sort of going crazy and, and whatever else. I think obviously the most interesting thing for blockchain right now, as it sits, is um, NFTs. Uh, non-fungible tokens. You'll see what uh, NBA is doing with Top Shot, um, and the, it's built on uh, the blockchain where they've authenticated digital cards. I mean, to me, this is like the most interesting thing on the on the internet right now, uh, where they've like created artificial scarcity with these digital cards. Like in January uh, alone, like the top card for a, a LeBron James dunk is like hundred thousand yep. dollars. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. So I think, um, you know. I'm not so romantic about the blockchain piece. I think it's going to be like the electricity. It's like the interesting companies that can sort of capture the culture. And I think like Top Shot has sort of done that where they can build things on top of the blockchain and like it's just there in the background. But I, I still believe that we are early days um, because nothing has really touched the average consumer. Like my mom like, has no idea what the blockchain is. She's not transacted on the blockchain, but people are starting to do that with like the NFTs, the top shots of the world, you're seeing creator coins sort of come up. Um, yeah, so, so I think that is, uh, that's gonna be fascinating. I love it. The, the next two topics you just said. So let's, let's talk about top shot first. That's what yeah. I, that's, I well, was waiting for the end because I know you're gonna be excited. Oh shit, it. okay. Yeah, no, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, I feel like on this pod, I'm like explaining a lot of things for people that, because I know most people are probably, you know, they're, 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 they're listening to this car and we got, by the way, if you listen to this far, and you're listening to this podcast, subscribe to this guy, like and rate and review this guy. He's putting a lot of work into to all his content. And uh, please do that. Um, I think, okay, so just to piggybacking off my last comment on blockchain, I think NBA Top Shot is uh, the best platform for monetizing fandom where you can now own uh, certain moments in the NBA. I think it's fascinating. I think it's fascinating to see how people have really, um, uh, you know, built this, this economy out of nothing, right? And now they're attributing, attributing real value to these moments. Um, I, so I think, yeah, we're just starting it and it's going to be really fascinating to see. Uh, I, I've been sort of annoyed with Topshop because I've been trying to 
you know, buy, buy packs and stuff like that. And the platform, I, I think just, they just been overwhelmed yeah. with, with, uh, with the bandwidth. So I haven't actually been buying that many packs or, or using the marketplace because I, I find it slow, but once they get their own app and they, you know, they kind of uh, get things going, I, you know, I'm excited to, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think also for people that like right now, it's like getting into like crypto early. It's like, you know, that LeBron James in January, 2021 is worth a hundred thousand dollars. Like by next year, it might be a million. Yeah. You just don't know. So top shot is, is what also got me excited about everything that's going on with, you know, the NFTs and the blockchain. And I'm actually have, I got the community manager coming on the podcast, I think next week to like, just dive into it more. But oh, think, wow. Okay, cool. Yeah. I think the potential for this, like, I just think they, I always, I love the NBA, I love Adam Silver and whoever else is behind all this stuff, but I always feel like they're always forward, forward thinking, forward moving. And I love that they did this first. And I also like you tried to buy something and it crashed, but I, I follow all the guys. So they're always tweeting about, you know, they're fixing the servers. Uh, and whatnot, which yeah. Like I, Apart. Like I have, a, I have my own sort of, uh, I've been buying like some of the packs and, and some stuff off the marketplace. I yeah. haven't been as heavy on it, uh, mostly because it's, it's a time factor, but I just, I just, um, for me, it's like to dabble, right? It's the, it's the yeah, it's just, get my feet wet. And um, yeah, I just find it fascinating. It's, it's, it's really going to be the mo most interesting space. Um, yeah. I agree. And one more I want to build off of is, yeah, I'm excited for Top Shot. And I recently just, I think about last week or something, I started to see more and more about creator coin. And, you know, yes. obviously as someone who's trying to be at the forefront of what a creator led brand is, I'm interested. So I'm, you know, doing research, I'm finding all these different things. And, you know, it, it's interesting to me what they're trying to do with creator coin. It's not where I want it to be, but I just want to hear, you know, do you have any thoughts on the creator coin and how that could potentially evolve? Yeah. I, I, I'm going to be honest. I'm not as uh like this is something that I'm not a practitioner in. Yeah. Um, I tried to create my own creator coin on Rally, I think it's called. Rally, um, that's the website I checked out, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's highly likely if you are a creator over the next number of years that you will have a coin. I think the idea of somehow, uh, again, like monetizing fandom and is... I think it's interesting. We have never been able to sort of put uh, people on a stock exchange, which I, I'm sure you have friends that you're like, okay, I'd love to just like put in like, you know, money into this person because I know they're going to blow. I think the creator coin is probably the easiest uh, part of it right now. I don't see many people on it, but it's, um, I believe that pretty soon everyone will probably have a coin. Like every creator will have a coin. And um, it's going to act just like the stock market. And um, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be interesting. So like, for example, if I put in, let's say NAV and coin is trending yeah. and you have, you have basically stock in, in NAV and coin and, and you as NAV and have stock in your own coin. Um, imagine if you can convert those into dollars and then that, or, or whatever, maybe it's not dollars, maybe it's just a Bitcoin or whatever. And now you're able to sort of uh, give back to your own community. You can sort of continue to build on your your, your momentum. Uh, so I think it's the, I've been always trying to, I've been, I've been actually trying to do this myself, which is how do I crumb, come up with like a creator uh, fund or something like that, or like a creator something where I just see this, I believe in this creator economy so much. And I believe that it is the next wave of innovation. And to me, it's like, how do you, how do you, yeah, I, I have no idea. I don't know if it's a fund or if it's something where you can, I haven't figured it out yet, but I, I believe in it. And I think this coin is definitely uh, uh, starting to figure that out. Yeah, I agree. So like I said, I like, I like to be a forward thinker and push in the lab and, you know, new ways and new directions that no one else is doing in our industry. So there's an idea that I'm going to save for offline as soon as this podcast is over to tell you about, and actually just ask, see if you Ooh. have any insight to see if you have any insight on it. Cause there's something I, I really want to do with uh, creator coin NFTs and stuff in the lab. So anyways, I'll tease the audience with that and have that conversation with you offline. But last topic, you know, we're nearing about an hour here. So last topic, I think this is, I don't know, the king of disruption. I don't even know if that's, if I can say that or not, but the Elon, king of Musk, disruption. Elon Musk, man is yeah. 
Is it fair to say that, you know, what's your thoughts on Elon? He's doing all kinds of cool stuff. Everyone loves following his tweets. He's talking to Kanye, I think tomorrow or something on clubhouse. Yeah. And I just saw he was on Joe Rogan right now. Oh, wow. Um, okay. yeah. Um, I think Elon is the, uh, probably the greatest marketer to ever live. Um, he has built two things that are remarkable. He has built what I call innovation capital where he, people believe in the things that he's building so much yes. that they're will that he's convinced the market, his P his own people and the stock market of, you know, what he's been able to do or what he's going to do uh, with his companies. And that's why if you look at what Tesla has done in the stock market over the last you know year, it's just been ridiculous. ridiculous yeah. Uh, the other thing that I think that Elon has, which is the deadly combination is that he has cultural capital, right? He's, he has captured the imagination of people from a cultural standpoint. And that's why he can peddle things like Bitcoin or Dogecoin, Dogecoin, and, and just, you know, just his mention will sort of, you know, put people in a frenzy. And I think it's fascinating. You know, if you listen to him, he's not the most compelling pe person to listen to. He's not the sexiest person to watch. Uh, but he, he is changing the world. Um, and whether he's a, the biggest scam artist in the world, he's still executing against it. Right. And I think he um, has done a, a remarkable job at, be, at doing both at creating his own innovation capital and cultural capital. And um, uh, it's going to be interesting to see if if the house collapses, but I don't think so. I think he is executing. Yeah. He is creating great innovations, and uh, I love to watch it, man. I it's it's been fascinating to watch. What are your takes on what? What's your take on it? I don't know, man. I just I just think Elon is just like you said. He's just he's just so different. And I, I like that you kind of explain innovation capital because I think like no matter what he does, if he wants to make something for a boring company or a spinoff tomorrow or whatever, people are gonna follow because he's already established that he can, he's, you know, the best at what he does. And, you know, if he's putting something out there, you know, it's going to be a high quality product and all that kind of stuff. And people are going to kind of flock to it. And the Tesla. Yeah. Stuff I, is a example. I think, I think that's the interesting part is that, you know, he came out with that cyber truck. Right. And yes, you know, if most people came out with that cyber truck, they'd be like, yo, this thing is hot it's a flop. garbage. It'll like, be a flop. Yep. It, it's, it looks like a flop. Right. But because Elon's behind it, he like bends our imagination to be like, yes. oh, this might be kind of dope, right? <laughs> exactly. And uh, <laughs> and I think that's that's the most interesting part is that he's he's bending our imagination of what is reality, and um, yeah, he's he's created this great brand around it. And I think he I think although he's not the most charismatic person in the world, I think he understands what's cool, right? And he understands, um, yeah, how to attract uh, create the coolness. And I think nerds are cool. Right. And he's like a giant nerd. Uh, that's the nerds have come, are, have come back. Man. As per expected, you spoke beautifully, eloquently, whatever nice word we want to use about every single topic <laughs> that was presented to you. So I appreciate you. You have a, an immense amount of knowledge on, like you said, a wider range of topics. Well, I had to explain everything on the pod. I, I had to yeah, go put into you on the spot, all the, man. put you on the spot. <laughs> that's, that's what you get when you come on here. Um, uh, no, but, but seriously, you killed it. I appreciate it. Before we kind of you know move towards the end, can you just let people know where to follow you? Maybe what to expect if you have any events coming up. You know anything you want to say? The floor is yours. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, number one, follow this guy because he, again, like he's putting in the work. Follow him, number one, and then number two, uh, yeah, you can follow me anywhere. Um, you know, LinkedIn is my platform, but I'm trying to build out my uh, TikTok and and YouTube and other places. I'm Sh Sean Canungo. I'm the only Sean Canungo, so you, you're not gonna have a problem finding me. But uh, yeah, just, uh, just uh, you know, I, I like to think of myself as a creator as well. So, um, you know, yeah, if you can follow some of my content, that would be great. <laughs> this man is the, the leader in what he's doing, excited for the next few years. Like you said, you said at the beginning, hopefully this can be a podcast that we do multiple times, whatever it is going to be. Yeah, man. But expect to see Sean on the, on the channel, on the podcast a lot more, just topping up about, you know, these type of topics that are interesting that you guys love, you guys want to learn more about. Follow him, follow the journey. And Sean, thank you again, man. I can't wait for the for the next one. Thank you, my man. It was it was fun. Uh -huh.